Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Three Plastic Surgeons and a Fourth. I'm Sam Jurikar in Dallas, joined as always by Dr. Sal Pacella in La Jolla, California, who is at San Diego Plastic Surgeon, Dr. Larry Tong in Toronto, uh, Canada, who is at Yorkville Plastic Surgery, and Sam Ray in Paramus, New Jersey, who is, can be found at Bergen Cosmetic. I'm a little intimidated, but I guess I'll try to uh, I'll try to go on here. Today, we're going to talk about a topic that we all get uh, asked about, and I'm not sure if we agree on, so this will be very interesting, but we're going to talk about uh, various exercise restrictions after different kinds of breast surgery. Before we get into the meat of it, I think Dr. Ree is going to read our disclaimer. Go. Thank you. This show is not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The show is for informational purposes only. Treatment and results may vary based upon circumstances, situation, and medical judgment after appropriate discussion. Uh, with your provider. Always seek the advice of your surgeon or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding medical care and never disregard professional me medical advice or delay seeking advice because of something in this show. All right. So the uh, the genesis for this podcast topic is that we all have been asked by um, our patients about exercise restrictions after breast surgery, um, whether it's a breast augmentation, a breast lift, or a combination thereof. And one of the things that I hear about from patients is that there's not a lot of consistency between surgeons. They don't even understand our rationale behind it. So, um, Dr. Ree, let's start with you first. What are your restrictions after a breast augmentation um, when it comes to doing just exercise in general, when it comes to upper body weightlifting? And does the placement of the implant in front of or behind the muscle have any impact on your recommendations to your patients? Yeah, I've gotten burnt a couple times with breast augmentation and uh, allowing patients to go back a little bit too early or or maybe they took my guidelines a little bit too liberally uh, in terms of what they did. And I've gotten more and more conservative as I've uh, progressed in my practice. Um, I, I do. And you're right. There's no there's no objective analysis or specific guidelines that I'm aware of in terms of breast augmentation and what sort of activities are allowed immediately or later uh, in, uh, in patients. I will say, I have heard surgeons say to patients, you should never do push-ups again. You should never do certain exercises again now that you have implants in place. And um, I disagree with that. I think the long-term uh, um, outcomes for breast augmentation patients is Pretty much anything you've done before you had breast augmentation, within reason, you should be able to do afterwards. Now, as a CrossFit coach and someone who uh, works with a lot of CrossFit athletes, does it um, make me wince a little bit when I see certain types of exercises being done? Uh, yeah, but I have not seen anything long-term that tells me I need to restrict what, what patients do uh, after a, appropriate healing time. Now, during that initial he healing time, I do know, and I have seen personally that if you go too aggressively, especially as you mentioned, upper body activity, you can cause some major problems. You, you do need to allow that tissue to heal. Um, I do prefer most of my implants, um, to be behind the muscle. Um, I don't do a ton that are only under the, the gland. Um, and, I think that that pocket is one that, um, you know, you're cutting through the pectoralis muscle. There, there are real, uh, there's real trauma there in terms of allowing that area to heal with a foreign object in place. And so at this point, I am pretty much hardcore, you know, almost eight weeks, like can't really do much waist up. If you want to walk, you can walk. You can do very light Stairmaster, maybe tops. Eight, at eight weeks, huh? Yeah, almost well, six why, to eight. Why do you, why? Why, because, do you, why eight weeks? Because they don't listen. So you say eight, they'll do six. <laughs> <laughs> well, very, very, really very, 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 very scientific. Yeah. I, I like yeah, that. Yeah. So, so I go, I go beyond what I really should be. I'm overly conservative because I know that they're going to kind of push it and go. Well, he's she said eight, so that means I'm, I'm, I heal fast, so I could do six or even four, and so. So I, I am very conservative now in terms of what I allow my patients to do. And, you know, so it's only a couple more weeks. So who cares? Like, they'll so get back in. So, 
So I'm going to summarize your answer because I want to go and ask everyone. For a standard breast thawage sub pack, you say no upper body weightlifting for eight weeks. Yep. All right, Larry, what, I, what, uh, tell me your philosophy. Uh, so in the, in the early post-operative post -operative period, uh, I don't want them to do any form of exercise at all. And that would be for the first four weeks. Uh, one of my main concerns is actually a uh, hematoma. And, uh, for the, for the viewers, um, after you've had surgery, you're going to have a lot of little blood vessels that are healing and they're not that durable yet because they've been cut through and they've been cauterized, which means we, you know, use the, um, instrument to sort of singe the vessel. So it stops bleeding, um, or the blood vessel has clotted and, and they're not very durable. So if you elevate your heart rate or your blood pressure significantly, which is associated with exercise, you can get one of those blood vessels to pop open. And if they pop open, you're going to have bleeding inside. And once you have bleeding inside, you can have some major issues, um, all the way up to needing emergency surgery. So it's very important not to, uh, do anything that's going to elevate your heart rate or your blood pressure, um, in the first little while. And I usually put that at about four weeks. Of course, as time goes by, you're going to get, um, more and more healed and it's going to be more acceptable to, to do exercise for upper body, um, exercises. I will start. Uh, I will allow patients to start at four weeks after surgery, but I won't say that they can, you know, go back to, you know, bench pressing 200 pounds or something like that. I want them to start, um, slowly see how they feel and gradually work their way up. And probably by the time they hit about five or six weeks after the surgery, they, they can be back up at their original, um, you know, intensity, um, and you know, that's worked for me. Um, my patients generally, I, I believe they listen to me. Maybe they've been doing it earlier than that. Um, and I've just been lucky and they haven't ran into any problems. Um, but usually I start them off at four weeks. And are you doing strictly subpectoral placement of your implants or are you following the Canadian trend of a subfascial implant? No, I, I do not do <laughs> subfascial implants. Um, I, I. I still believe that subpectoral implants, um, give you, um, a superior, uh, result overall, uh, with everything, um, taken into account. So I would say I'll do a, a few subglandular augmentations. I, I do, you know, very rarely do subfascial. Usually that's when a patient requests it and I've, you know, gone over the reasons and the pros and cons. And if they're okay with that, then yeah, I'll do a subfascial. Uh, but no, it's usually subpectoral. Dr. Pacella. Um, so for straightforward augs, um, I usually, I usually want them to take it easy for the first week. And so what I, what I say by taking easy is I want you up walking around for sure. You can take a little stroll down the block. If you like nothing, get your heart rate up too crazy. After the first week, you can start to resume a little bit of cardio. And there's a strategic reason for that. I think the risk of hematoma is really the, 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 the concern I have in the first week. And, and if you, I, I personally feel if you get, if you get beyond 72 hours, I think the risk of hematoma is pretty limited in the first week after that. So, so at the first week, I allow them to do, get on the bike, get on the treadmill, do a little gentle jogging. If they're up for it, keeping in mind that, you know, you don't want to do this with your arms as if you're holding on to something or you're doing a stationary bike, it's a much easier scenario. So no, and I don't recommend any lifting greater than 10 pounds, uh, until the fourth week. So like Larry, I do four weeks. I don't think you really have to go out to six weeks or eight weeks, um, necessarily. Um, and I specifically tell them, you know, the key is listen to your body. I wouldn't, I would go very light for the first four weeks, even if you were stopping your weightlifting for four weeks, you can't immediately go back to doing it the same way anyway, let alone surgery. So you got to really take it easy, go light, slowly work your way up. And, and I've found that to be reasonably successful. I, I don't think that sutures disrupt, even if I'm using mesh or some sort of other tissue support. Um, 
I haven't found that after four weeks, it's any, any major concern. And are you predominantly subpetrol with your implants as well? You know, I'm kind of uh, doing half and half now. So I am utilizing much more subglandular, subfascial, but in those scenarios, I'm using some additional mesh support. I think, I, yeah, I think I'm closer to Pachella and Tong than to the uh, Dr. Re eight weeks of no exercise. Um, I, I do about 30% subfascial, about 70% subpectoral. It's probably my, my uh, estimate. I, um, just like you guys, am, am worried about hematoma. I have had, uh, over the years, three patients get hematomas between weeks two and three for overzealous exercise. Uh, one went for a five mile run. Wanted a one did a hardcore Pilates uh, spin class and and uh, and, a, and a Pilates class. So I, I I tell people no exercise at all for three weeks, and in three weeks I let them do everything. One caveat though: patients that are really muscular that I've gone subpetrol with, I do think if they start working out quickly, um, I think it'll take them longer for their implants to drop just because the muscle is so strong. But I don't think it really impacts their long term results. Um, where I do change what I do specifically with upper body weightlifting is for secondary cases, whether it's an aug pexy and we're doing some sort of extensive capsule work, or if we're using mesh, like you had alluded to before. So before I, well, I'll just start this. If I'm doing, if I'm doing a mesh case, well, let's say it's a aug pexy or someone whose implants are bottom, bottomed out. And I, I, I almost always put those implants behind the muscle. Um, and I usually sew one edge of the muscle uh, to the mesh and those patients, I don't let them do any upper body weightlifting for about three months. Do you think I'm being overly conservative with that? Yes. No, I don't, mm, I don't think so. No, but, but okay. I'll say this. I mean, I've gotten burnt just like you have with a late hematoma, which is why I'm so conservative at this point. I, I, I never want to see that. Um, I, I don't, I don't see any major problem. Listen, I, I'm a fitness freak myself. So I understand that it can be difficult for patients not to want to exercise, but I deal with some very, um, you know, some people who do a lot of high intensity training and if you let them go, they will just go crazy. So I am very conservative with that. I, I feel like, um, having gotten burnt a couple of times, I, I just don't want to deal with that. I want, I want to make sure from a positioning standpoint as well, what, um, Sam said, like, I really want to make sure the implants have uh, dropped into the right position. I want, I want all that to be okay before I cut, you know, I cut them loose. Um, I think for pexies, uh, I, I sort of keep about the same, uh, protocol. Um, you know, you do have to watch the incisions a little bit more carefully, um, for scars and making sure that they heal nicely. But I mean, you know, if, if I say eight and they cut it to six, I feel safe. If I say four and they cut it to two, I'm, I'll get burnt. I know I will. Yeah. I, you know, for, for most of my surgeries, my, my exercise protocol is, is basically the same four weeks. And then you can start exercising again for me, because, uh, I like to, you know, simplify things and do minimalistic sort of things. I don't want to have a protocol for every surgery that I do. I'll just say. You know, take it easy for the first four weeks. You want to uh, not do anything that's going to elevate your heart rate or your blood pressure. Walking is okay, but, you know, not too fast. And then once you hit four weeks, you can start gradually reintroducing uh, upper body or any kind of exercise and, you know, go slowly until you get back uh, to your, your previous uh, intensity. Do you guys think that um, there's an issue if you exercise too early about displacement? of the implant, meaning it moving, I guess, too laterally, um, because that's what happens when, you know, for the viewers, the, when, when you have implants that are under the muscle and, and, uh, you contract the, the, uh, the chest muscle, the implants will naturally shift slightly laterally. That tech, that's well, generally I, I, not an issue after everything is healed, but do you guys feel that that can well, cause I, some problems with the positioning of the implant if it's done? early in the recovery? I mean, I, I, I disagree a little bit. I think it's an issue whether or not it's four weeks or 12 weeks or a year. I think part of the reason why I've converted a lot going towards, um, 
towards uh, subfascial is to avoid that lateral displacement. And I, I found that on a lot of primary augs I've done early in my career, they've come back, they've been happy, but they've bottomed, they've lateralized a little bit. And I, I think that's a real, real issue just by nature of the operation, not necessarily on the immediate post-operative period. Do you think that has to do with the volume of implant? Like when you're creating a pocket and you have a large volume that, no, it doesn't matter. Like no, I, if it's, I, no, if I, it's I, 150 I'm not... versus 550, you don't feel well, like there's an issue I, well, with I mean, that? I mean, that, that's a big difference, but say like, say the difference between um, a 325 and a, a 700, you know, I think it happens equally in a 325. Um, so yeah, maybe not in a 150 because it's relatively small, but any tension whatsoever on the pocket, I think there's potential for lateral displacement. And that, that's a, that's a big disappointment in my opinion, in, in the way we've been taught to do breast augmentation, despite the benefits of having it underneath the muscle with the reduction of risk of capsular contracture. I think the lateral displacement and the bottoming out is, is, a um, is an issue. Yeah. And I think a lot of patients too somehow believe that having a behind the muscle is going to make them less likely to bottom out. Even after all this time, patients don't realize that the implant being behind the muscle doesn't mean that there's support along the lower margin of the implant and that they can still bottom out. And in some ways with a lot of forcible contraction, at least theoretically, you could bottom out more because every time your muscle contracts, you could be pushing down with a downward vector on the implant. You know, in terms of what you're saying, um, I think that a lot, you know, a lot of the cases that I do, and I'm sure you guys do as well, are secondary breast cases. Because once you have a breast implant and you're committed to having it, you're going to need to have those implants exchanged or lifts or what, what not just do chronically. In those cases, I think, um, I think I agree completely with Pachella. I think the smaller implant um, can still very much laterally or inferiorly displace as much as the bigger implants. I don't necessarily agree with that with a primary AUG. I don't think a 325 bottoms out to the same extent as a 700 for a primary hour. I just haven't seen that. But, um, but, I, but for secondary cases, I definitely would agree. Um, I will say that when it comes to these secondary cases, these odd pexies, I almost always go behind the muscle. I know some guys like going in front, but I go behind the muscle. Um, and in those cases, when there are these cases where I'm doing a lot of capsule work, I let them exercise at four weeks, just like you guys, actually three weeks. But I won't let them do any sort of upper body forcible pec contractions if I can help it for three months. Because I do worry that a lot of these sutures that I'm putting in or the mesh that I'm putting in with forcible contraction of the pep can, can rip, rip out. And I have had a patient in the past who, unbeknownst to me, was some sort of power lifter. And two months afterwards, she completely detached the inner margin of one of her, uh, you know, of, of her mesh. And she got this huge displacement that I had to reoperate on. I'm sure you guys, Dan, you were mentioning you had a case where you had some issues too, with your upper body working out. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, I understand when patients really care about their fitness, but as you said, you really have to let that pec muscle heal almost in its entirety before you can really start to go aggressive with it. And um, did you not know she was a power lifter? Did she not look like a power lifter? Wow. Okay. I mean, most power lifters I know look like Lou Ferrigno, basically. I don't great. Yeah. Okay. Um, did not look like Lou Ferrigno. Not to me. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. Maybe she was new to the sport of power lifting. She was a, an aspirational power lifter. I always wanted to yeah. do power lifting. I just thought that onesie was just a little bit too, uh, too aggressive a look for me. So I passed on that. I got it. So, um, Sal, I, I was curious. So are you saying that you don't really get lateral displacement now if you, if you put these implants subglandular or subfascial? Because my impression is that that actually happened more. And I think that the lateral displacement, um, is, is related to the, the size of the implant. I think that, um, when uh, when you've had breast implants in and when you sleep, the, the implants sort of, you know, how you, how you have patients complain that they drop into the armpits. I, th I think that's because over time, if, if they're sleeping on their back, the, the mass of the implants will just slowly stretch that lateral pocket out and, and have it, you know, drift more and more 
uh, to the side. And I think that um, the weight of the implant and, and time has a big deal uh, to do with it. So the size of the implant plus time, I think, can cause lateral uh, displacement. A lot of times if a patient has a larger implant, I'll actually advise them that they might consider wearing a bra to sleep, like a bra that pushes uh, uh, the implants together. The other thing with um, lateral displacement is that you, you, a lot of times you can prevent some degree of lateral displacement when you when you put the implants in, you try not to release the muscle too much, release just enough so that you can get good positioning, especially medially, so the, the inner portion of, of, the, of the muscle. Maybe you just thin that out. Maybe you don't cut all the way through uh, so that it's totally detached. I, because I think that once you detach more of the pec, you'll get more more movement, more displacement, and that will you know cause um, more animation uh, of the implant. So I guess like do you, do you see less lateralization if if it's uh, over the muscle? Oh, we You're just on lost. Mute. Yeah, mute. You're on mute. Um, I, let me say, I'm almost exclusively doing subfascial with mesh. So I, with the caveat of preventing any of that from happening, and I, I will say, I think it, it's been incredibly successful. Um, I absolutely hear what you're saying when it comes to subfascial or subglandular without mesh. And that's why I never really did or embraced that operation. Um, and so I, I don't, I, I'm never really in a situation where I'm doing a subfascial or subglandular without some sort of soft tissue support. And, and with the intention of maintaining cleavage, maintaining good medial position, preventing lateral display. These are primary augs you're doing with mesh? Yes. Yes. Exclusively. Because, okay, because I'll do a fair number of subfascial without mesh. Um, and how do you think they're yeah. looking? How do you, how do you feel they look? So, uh, so, so first of all, I, I think it's worth talking about why would one do a subfascial and not a subpectoral? It's not just a, you know, it's for certain anatomic issues. If they have a tuberous breast, uh, I think it's, uh, it's helpful. If they've got, um, uh, if it's a male to female case, um, which I, I've had a fair number of those in my practice, I think they're really useful for that. I think for women that have, you know, grade one, early grade two ptosis who are on the cusp about, you know, on the border for, for getting, um, you know, for getting a lift, uh, or getting a mastopexy at the same time, it can be useful for that. But I think the key is not to go too big with the implant. I think a sub uh, big implant is a disaster just waiting to happen. Um, I'm pretty restrictive in terms of what I'll have them do post off of the way I'll make them wear a bra 24 seven for three months post off when, when I, when I go sub and. Typically, I haven't seen a big difference in terms of bottoming out compared to to subpectoral. I mean, and lateral displacement. I really haven't, um, which means it happens with both for me. It's not like it doesn't happen. It happens with equal frequency for for both subpectoral and and subfascial. But I would say that you know lateral displacement is something that you don't see early on. Like you don't you see it like years after the surgery. That's that's my impression. I agree. I agree. I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. So I, I think um, what I'm walking away from this is we do things differently, you know? And if there's a take home message that I would have for patients, it would be listen to your surgeon because they have a very clear cut rationale for what they're doing. Get clear answers to, you know, to your questions ahead of time. Don't go to other patients to try to figure out what to do because there's different circumstances that may have your surgeon to have the, the specific guidelines to do. Um, Sure. Any clo any closing thoughts, anyone? Excellent no? topic. Excellent topic. Okay. Well, as always, thanks for to our listeners for watching, and until later, gents. Mm -hmm.